Greetings from American Exception. I'm Aaron Good, back with another installment in our Empire and the Deep State series on my book, American Exception. This series is a joint production of American Exception and the Geopolitical Economy Report. I am again joined by Ben Norton and series producer Seamus McGinnis. In today's episode, we look at JFK's policies toward the Middle East, but really toward Israel most specifically. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton, and this is the Empire and Deep State series. It's a joint production of Geopolitical Economy Report and the American Exception podcast, which is hosted by Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis, two friends of mine. And this series is a history of the U.S. Empire and Deep State. It's based on Aaron's book, American Exception, Empire and Deep State. And right now we're going through the history of the John F. Kennedy administration. In the previous episode, and in the by the way, in the description below, we link to a playlist that has all of the past episodes, so you can go through chronologically. In the previous episode, we discussed John F. Kennedy's policies toward Egypt and Nasser, and that came after we discussed his policies toward Indonesia and, in general, the non-aligned movement. Uh, Nasser in Egypt and Sukarno in Indonesia being two co-founders of the non-aligned movement. And today we're going to be speaking about JFK's foreign policy in other parts of the so-called Middle East or West Asia and also North Africa. And we're specifically going to be talking about Israel. And I think this is a very important moment in terms of U.S.-Israel relations, because since 1967, the U.S. and Israel have been such close allies. Israel has really been an extension of the U.S. empire. And in 1967, when Israel occupied uh, at first, you know, uh, the, the Sinai, so part of Egypt, and also Jordan, the West Bank, and also Syria's Golan Heights, which is still occupied today. Uh, when Israel began these, this occupation in 1967, that was the moment really when Tel Aviv became one of Washington's key allies. But what's often forgotten is that before 67, Israel was a U.S. ally, but they were not as close as they are. And we discussed the Suez crisis in which the U.S. did not support Israel. It was actually Britain and France that allied with Israel. So the reason I mention that is that here in the 60s, this moment we're talking about before JFK is assassinated in 63, there was a moment where there was a little more political space in the U.S. to criticize Israel. So Aaron, let, let's start with that context. What were Kennedy's policies toward Israel and how did they differ from the Eisenhower administration's policies? And especially how do they differ from the bipartisan orthodoxy that we've seen ever since 1967? Well, it's this is laid out uh, pretty well in a book by Monica Wiesack. And uh, I, I actually had her on the, sh the podcast uh, a couple months ago, uh, and she was a, a great guest. And she has a, a day job. She's not a professional academic or anything like that. And she wrote this book, America's Last President, where she lays out all these things that Kennedy wanted to do. And she is someone who admires, she's, she's probably more straightforwardly admiring of Kennedy than I am, which I think is what motivated her to write the book. Uh, and that I could quibble about some things about the book. I think in some ways she uh, presents a very, a, a, a very one-sided account of Kennedy, which, which doesn't go into some of the, the very bad policies that the U S government was still carrying out under Kennedy. However, I think that she also doesn't spend as much time dealing with the, um, the dark side of the, the U S power structure uh, which, which I think, once you account for that, you know, Kennedy does actually seem what he was able to do seems seem pretty impressive compared to the leaders we have today. So I, I really would recommend this book, even if it's uh, th there are some things about it where she could be more nuanced and critical of, of of Kennedy or qualify this in different ways. It's actually a really good book and a useful resource. So I, I want to give her props here uh, rather than just like cribbing from her her book where she does compile a lot of useful information which uh, to understand a lot of these policies, she, she tracks down a lot of the important correspondences. So I drew from her a bit for the Nasser episode and uh, for this one especially. And uh, Jim Diogenio also has written about Kennedy in the Middle East 
and not that many people have. So he has articles in this area that are, I think, important to look at as well. Now, uh, Kennedy uh, ha had a guy in the National Security Council who was in charge of Middle Eastern affairs. His name was Robert Comer. And his last, um, his, his last correspondence, or his last memo uh, dealing with Israel policy during JFK administration, uh, he wrote this in, it was issued on um, November 21st. And it was uh, written in, earlier in the memo. He writes about how the Israeli foreign minister, uh, Mordecai Gazet, had informed him that the U.S.-Israeli relationship was entering a state of crisis. So this is in November of 1963, very end of Kennedy's life, although he doesn't know it. And Robert Comer had said about Israel and, and U.S. as a whole that, that we were ships passing each other in the night. Okay, that's the way he, he spoke about, about the U.S. and Israel. And there were four points about this crisis that are uh, the, the, the four points of contention between the U.S. and Israel that led to this state of crisis. Uh, the first one is the Palestinian refugee issue, which was not as big an issue in 1963 as it would become in 1967 once, of course, they take over the occupied territory or take over the territories that we now know the occupied territories in a, in a war they start. Uh, there's also JFK's relationship with Arab countries. We did talk about how he was close to Nasser in the last episode, and he was the one U.S. statesman who was pro nasser He didn't really have much support in Congress or uh, or elsewhere, and, but he wanted to help Nasser even as he had he, he was an ally to Israel as well as the U.S. was. Uh, third was the attempts to register the American Zionist Council, a Zionist lobby group in the U.S. as a foreign agent. They are basically the direct precursor to the APAC. Um, the fourth one is Israel's nuclear weapons program. So on all these issues, Kennedy, uh, these were issues that where Kennedy was taking positions that were uh, aggravating the Israeli leadership. And so this was the, this is what it caused a state of crisis. So this state of crisis as, as being asserted by Israel is because Kennedy is, is standing up to Israel in ways that s previous and subsequent presidents would not. Uh, the, on the Palestinian refugee issue, JFK committed himself um, through letters to Arab leaders uh, to the UN Resolution 194, uh, Article 11 of, of this UN Resolution, which was written in 1948, which stated um, that refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practical date, and that compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return and for the loss of or damage to property, which under principles of international law or in equity should be made good by the governments or authorities responsible. So this is, uh, you know, saying that there should be some right to um, return or to be compensated for this. And Kennedy was forcefully saying that he uh, supported this. Now, to Nasser at the same time, he was writing about this issue and he said, I, want, I wish to state unequivocally uh, that this government's position is anchored and will continue to be anchored in the firm bedrock of support for General Assembly recommendations concerning the refugees and of active impartial concern that these recommendations be implemented in a beneficial way. Okay, so Kennedy was saying this to Nasser. He was saying this to is to uh, uh, Israel that they supported this. Now this led to his support for Resolution 194. This aggrieved uh, Ed Asner here. Oh no, that's actually David Ben Gurion. When I saw this picture, I actually thought I thought it was maybe David. Uh, I thought it was Ed Asner playing the Gurian. <laughs> I, I honestly thought that I thought did this, is this from a movie because of the revolution or uh, resolution, but it, it is Ben Gurian who just does look a little like Ed Asner. But I have a higher opinion of Ed Asner for what it's worth. Who, who, who's kind of a heroic dude as actors go. Um, but okay, JFK stated this support for the UN Resolution 194. This aggrieves David Ben Gurian who sends his own letter. In the fall of 1962, um, to the Israeli ambassador in Washington, and this was supposed to be circulated uh, among Jewish American leaders, but this letter states, Israel will regard this plan as a more serious danger to her existence than all the threats of the Arab dictators and kings, than all the Arab armies, than all of Nasser's missiles and his Soviet MiGs. Israel will fight against this implementation down to the last man. So this shows you even very early on how Israel was fixated upon um, not allowing the Arabs any sort of uh, right of return or compensation who they had expelled, who they had, who they had expelled, 
ethnically cleansed from Palestine. Uh, meeting with JFK in New York in May of 61, Ben-Gurion expressed a willingness to explore this issue of like, you know, compensation uh, with the, for the Palestinians. He said, yes, it is always worth trying. But elsewhere, this is what he's saying. This is what he's really saying and, and wanting to wanting Jewish American leaders to understand. Um, so Kennedy, in order to try to make this happen, um, he has this Johnson plan, which would use the UN to resolve the issue. And it was called the Johnson plan because of Joseph E. Johnson, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And the crux of the plan was to stay loyal to the substance and philosophy of the UN Resolution 194, but at the same time, protect Israeli security. And the whole plan was geared around giving each refugee the selection of a preference, which wasn't going to be guaranteed, but the options were repatriation, so return to Israel, reparations, so that would be no return to Israel, but compensation for lost property, or resettlement with compensation for lost property, primarily to Arab countries or potentially non-Arab countries. Now, around this time period, the, the Soviet Union sends arms to Egypt in 1962, JFK sells defensive, what are called defensive missiles to Israel, hoping this would assuage Israeli security concerns and reinforce the U.S. support for Israeli security and make them more likely to go along with the Johnson plan. But it has the opposite effect. Um, it doesn't have make them chill out at all. Instead, um, well, there's this White House memo that deals with this, and I, I don't need to read the whole thing, but... If you look at point number two, there's been no practical progress on the refugee question. In fact, the recent conversation, con conversation between uh, Meyer and the secretary indicate that Israel is saying it will not accept any refugees and no progress can be made on this question in the immediate future. We cannot accept this. This is categorical. The president is concerned. In fact, he is dissatisfied that Israel has not been more forthcoming. Uh, and then the third point, emphatically, we cannot and will not accept the status quo on this matter. We want and expect Israeli cooperation on the basis of the formula discussed by the president and Ben Gurion in 1961, some repatriation and plenty of resettlement. So this is a strong position taken by the president and uh, they're not, he's not really wanting to put up with Israeli intransigence on this or obfuscation or, or stalling tactics or anything else. Uh, JFK was willing to fight for the Johnson plan if it had a chance, according to uh, his ambassador to Israel named Walter or Walworth Barber, uh, Kennedy said, how much is it going to cost? And he's told it'll be about a billion and a half. Uh, that's a lot of money back then, but not a lot now. Um, Kennedy says, well, gentlemen, that's all right. It's a lot of money, but I don't mind a fight either getting this through Congress. Uh, it's a fight I'm prepared to accept. But can any of you people around the table tell me that I have any chance of winning this fight, that if we get this, this will work? Uh, that even if I win the fight in Congress, that it'll work. And there was no word. Uh, so the idea that it just wasn't workable, that he couldn't get the support for Congress and so on, uh, this was, the, the plan died. And then as a result, Johnson resigns on, in February of 63. Um, the U.S. tries to assure Israel that the choice was symbolically important, but realistically only a small number of refugees would go back and Israel would not be flooded with vast numbers of refugees. Um, so this was, this is a, a big failure of the Kennedy administration, but it wasn't that he wasn't trying. I mean, other presidents in the past were not even really putting pressure on uh, about this issue in any real serious way, I, I would argue. Um, and, and what was said about this is, um, you know, a, a state department employee wrote on the, on the positive side, we've made more progress with Arabs. Um, in terms of accepting realities that at any time in the past 14 years, they've been more rational and forthcoming by far than most of us have really dared hope. So, uh, and they even saying they'd been brought a long way on the road to accepting essentially a proposal which recognizes Israel's existence. So all of these discussions with Arab leaders were moving in a positive way and Israel was the real sticking point. Um, on November 20th, 1963, two days before the assassination, uh, the U.S. delegation at the U.N. gave its support for Resolution 194, which triggered fury among Israeli supporters. Uh, the Jewish Chronicle in London reported the reaction of the Israelis. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol summoned the U.S. ambassador and told him that Israel was shocked by the pro-Arab attitude adopted by the U.S. delegation. 
Golda Meir expressed Israel's astonishment and anger at the attitude of the U.S. So the, the Israelis were um, totally intransigent on this issue. And even at the very end of JFK's life, they're still totally opposed to, to this, uh, which I think is very telling. So we talked a little bit the last few episodes about uh, JFK's openness to, to Nasser in Egypt uh, and some of his other policies across the Middle East being a lot more open than some of uh, some of the presidents around him. So how did his policies in the Middle East or West Asia um, impact U.S.-Israeli relations? Well, JFK was quite different from some of these other presidents that we've had in that he was very engaged with the minutia of policy, especially in key areas. <clears throat> and Comer, who was his National Security Council appointment on Israel, he said that <clears throat> Kennedy cleared personally almost every, I would say probably every major foreign policy move in the entire Middle East area. They were all given the personal presidential chop. And when they weren't, we heard about it. So we quickly didn't try to conduct policy without keeping him fully clued. The problem is here that Israel's disdain and hatred for Nasser predated Kennedy and it would outlive him. Um, in 1954, you had the uh, Levon affair. And um, I believe that I even have a picture of Levon. Uh, this was a notorious scandal in, in Israel uh, it was a false flag bombing operation that was supposed to be, uh, be it was supposed to harm Nasser. They were going to bomb UK and US targets, and they're going to blame the uh, the Egyptians. Uh, and, and this was going to be uh, part of a plot to keep the British uh, from leaving Egypt because the, the, they didn't want any. Uh, you know, the British had a presence in in Egypt that was in part making the you know making it more difficult for Nasser to do what he wanted to do which was nationalize the Suez Canal and the Brit the the Israelis thought they could keep the Brits there by staging these bombings you know you kill a few people but this would be useful for foreign policy so it's a you know a false flag terror attack uh you also have in 1956 so we, for examples of how much the Israelis hated Nasser um before the Suez crisis you have um, this, Ben-Gurion explains his aims here, that he wants the Jordan to be eliminated as a state, wants the East Bank to go all the way to Iraq, or sorry, he wants the East Bank uh, of the, 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 to go to the state of Iraq and the West Bank to be annexed by Israel. So he had plans for you know, sort of redrawing the map there. And of course, the Suez crisis, Israel's a part of that, and it goes very badly because the U.S. intervenes on the side of, of Nasser. And, and not on the side of the Brits, the French, and the Israelis. It's a very unusual episode, but it actually shows that even under Eisenhower, which had the Dulles brothers running foreign policy, um, you had a concern for the way that the U.S. would appear to be backing colonial powers, that the U.S. the U.S. needed to have a good image in the third world and was actually concerned about this. And so this imperial gambit of this that was the Suez crisis where they tried to retake the Suez Canal from Nasser, uh, this was this failed and the U.S. did not back them ultimately. So this was a, a setback for these forces. But it doesn't matter. They get caught trying to blow up the, you know, stage bombings in Egypt. And you end up, the only thing that really happens is Levon resigns and some people had to spend time in Egyptian prisons. Um, and then the Suez crisis fails. Uh, it, it, it's a failure and a defeat for the Israeli, British, and French side. Now, in early 1962, Kennedy approves a big aid package for Egypt, half a million dollars or half a billion dollars to stabilize the economy. And this led uh, U.S. policy advisor Chester Bowles to say Nasser would play a key role in bringing Middle East peacefully into our modern world. So the plan was to actually modernize and accept nationalism uh, in, the, in the Arab world. Ben-Gurion uh, responded to this saying that <clears throat> if Egypt were not planning the annihilation of Israel, uh, financial aid could be regarded as a very positive action. However, in the present state of affairs, the aid serves, uh, notwithstanding the good intentions of those who grant it, to set the Russian arms in motion against Israel. So this Cold War angle can be even played up by Israelis saying that, like, well, you know, you're helping them, but you're kind of helping Russia. Uh, JFK's um, had a different 
attitude about this. And he wrote this to Ben Gurion. Um, he wrote that the uh, he continues to believe that the effort of the U.S. to develop effective relations with the Arab states are, in fact, in the long term interest of Israel, at least as much as of the United States and the Arab countries themselves. Uh, these effective relations have in, have significantly increased our influence with Arab leaders. Uh, and this is exercised on behalf of peace uh, and with full regard for Israel's security. OK, so he says more specifically. I really cannot agree with the suggestion that our limited economic assistance to the United Arab Republic, that's Egypt, can be considered as a force which serves, quote, and this is what Ben Gurion had written, to set the Russian arms in motion against Israel when the opportunity offers. Our own belief is that in reality, these economic relations reduce the dangerous influence of the Soviet Union and serve as a restraint on any Arab action which might be destructive to the peace of the area and the interests of the United States. So JFK is saying, this support for uh, Nasser and for countries in the Middle East is actually better because it, it improves conditions in these countries and brings them into an alliance with the United States and makes them more committed to peace in the region. And so it's actually good for is, Israeli security. That's the argument that he's making, that like peace and prosperity in the entire region are not just good for these Arab countries, but good for Israel as well. And in a press conference, he reiterates he, uh, his support for all sides here, the U.S. supports social, economic, and political progress in the Middle East. We support the security of both Israel and her neighbors. We seek to limit the Near East arms race, which obviously takes resources from an area already poor and puts them into an increasing race, which does nothing really uh, to bring any great security, which does not really bring any great security. We strongly oppose the use of force or the threat of force in the Near East. So Kennedy is stating very clearly his opposition to you know, uh, war and an arms race in the Middle East and wanting prosperity all around rhetorically. Of course, presidents can say all kinds of things. So you can, you know, anybody can argue about how sincere he is. But I think the policies he was pursuing, you can see this. Now, um, in May of 63, Ben Gurion offers to go to the United States to discuss various matters with JFK. But Kennedy actually declines and says, no, it's, it's generous of you to offer to come this way to Washington. And if it could remain private, this would be useful. But experience tells me in these sorts of times, uh, public attention is focused on you and the role of the US. There's no reasonable prospect that you and I could meet without publicity. I fear that a public meeting would have the effect of increasing the level of tension in the area and of promoting speculation, which could only be dangerous to our common purpose of maintaining stability and peace. So Ben Gurion wanted to go to the US and uh, talk to the president as a show of power and uh, this would be, you know, perceived as potentially sending a message to enemies of Israel that they had the, they were in the good standing of the United States. And JFK says, no, I don't, I actually, I don't, it's not good for me to be seen with you right now. It'll just make things worse. So I think this is, you know, this is notable. Uh, May of 63, there's a White House memo on how to respond to congressional attacks on JFK's supposedly pro Nasser Arab policy. And this, uh, this gets into it. This just tells you some of the problems that they had, the, uh, because there was no, they had no one who could think of anybody in Congress who could defend the administration. Uh, everyone was wishing that there was some liberal senator who felt differently and could therefore defend the administration. But even Arthur Schlesinger could think of no one in this category. So is, Israel had already by then really ach achieved a stranglehold over the U.S. over U.S. the U.S. Congress. Uh, in Comer's last communication uh, with Israel during the JFK administration, November 21, uh, he is complaining about this. He says, we're expected to subsidize Israel privately and publicly to support her to the hilt on every issue, to meet all her security requirements and defend her if attacked. In return, we did not even know what she intended to do in such critical fields as missiles and nuclear weapons. What kind of a relationship was this? Couldn't the Israeli government acknowledge just once that the U.S. had a defensible position in attempting to maintain good relations with the Arab states? So this shows you that at the end of Kennedy's presidency, you would really gotten to a crisis level with Israel. I mean, this was uh, one of the major crises that Kennedy was facing, along with so the civil rights issue in the U.S., along with trying to end the Cold War, trying to normalize relations with Cuba, potentially, um, and... Uh, wind down Vietnam. It's really, it's really something. Under LBJ, uh, the U.S. would cut economic aid to Egypt and boost the aid to Israel. 
According to historian Stephen Green in his book, Taking Sides, America's Secret Relations with a Militant Israel, the $92 million in military assistance provided in fiscal year 1966 was greater than the total of all official military aid provided to Israel cumulatively in all the years going back to the foundation of that nation in 1948. So this is a dramatic U-turn under Johnson. Uh, the equipment that that was sent in, the, in that year, uh, along with Johnson's cover-up of the attempted false flag USS Liberty attack staged by Israel, where they attack a U.S. ship, this helps Israel double her territory in 1967, something JFK would have been totally opposed to. Um, as he, he had assured Nasser against Israel uh, expanding its territory. Uh, LBJ would also invite Prime Minister Levi Eshkol to come on an official state visit, something JFK had denied to Ben-Gurion, um, while remaining open to a visit from Nasser. Uh, and regarding the USS Liberty attack, is the last thing I'll say on this issue here. <clears throat> this is George Ball. And he was Under Secretary of State. He wrote, by permitting a cover-up of Israel's attack on the Liberty President Johnson told the Israelis, in effect, that nothing they did would induce American politicians to refuse their bidding. From that time forth, the Israelis began to act as if they had an inalienable right to American aid and backing. And uh, that holds true to the present day. So on that note, then, as we know, the Israel lobby in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, even more intensely has a, a huge sway over a lot of our uh, our, you know, general political culture uh as we know in you know texas it's <laughs> it's anathema to talk about anything uh against israel and for such a small country like that there's just a lot of vested interest in keeping them as a, a sort of stronghold of u.s empire in the middle east uh, and as an outpost that has then grown into its sort of own power base within our politics you think about Ilan Omar a couple of years ago. It's a very good example of, of exactly how much that's grown over time. But as sort of a precursor to that, talk a little more about the American Zionist Council and uh, and what Kennedy tried to do to address that. Well, there was this attempt by the Justice Department, which was headed by Robert Kennedy, to register the American Zionist Council a lobbying group under the Foreign Agents Registration Act of 1938. Um, this required agents uh, of foreign principals who are engaged in political activities uh, to make periodic public disclosure of their relationship with the foreign principal, as well as activities, receipts, and disbursements in support of those activities. Um, so this is uh, supposed to limit the influence of foreign governments over U.S. politics. Now, during the 1960 presidential campaign, um, JFK had been approached by uh, a Zionist financier, Abraham Feinberg, according to JFK's close friend, Charles Bartlett. Um, as an American citizen, he was outraged to have a Zionist group come to him and say, we know your campaign is in trouble. We're willing to pay your bills if you let us have control of your Middle East policy. Uh, Bartlett recalled that Kennedy was deeply upset and concluded that if he ever did get to be president, he was going to do something about it. Um, so this is, you know, notable. Now, another quote here um, is from Gore Vidal, uh, and this is from a book called Jewish History, Jewish Religion, The Weight of 3,000 Years. And Gore Vidal wrote the foreword to this book. And this, I think, is, is fascinating. He wrote, sometime in the late 1950s, that world-class gossip and occasional historian John F. Kennedy told me how in 1948, Harry S. Truman had been pretty much abandoned by everyone when he came to run for president. He was, he was predicted to lose in 1948. That's why you got that famous headline of Dewey beats Truman, but it's Harry Truman holding the newspaper. Um, then an American Zionist brought him $2 million in cash in a suitcase aboard his whistle-stop campaign train. That's why our recognition of Israel was rushed through so fast. As neither Jack nor I was an anti-Semite, unlike his father and my grandfather, we took this to be just another funny story about Truman and the serene corruption of American politics. So uh, this was something that did stick in JFK's mind uh, about you know politics. He, he was not happy about the influence that the Zionist 
uh, lobby had in Washington. And he also wanted to change the campaign finance system. He actually wanted to, he, he floats ideas of uh, a potentially, you know, having publicly funded elections. Um, so JFK had wanted William Fulbright to be his secretary of state. Uh, but according to Arthur Schlesinger, uh, pressure from, you know, Zionist in, uh, sources killed Fulbright, his, his chances. Uh, and the JFK was forced to pick another candidate as his secretary of state. Um, Sle Schlesinger stated that Fulbright's opposition to an anti-Nasser policy aroused concern in the Jewish community. Um, so in, in this is Senator William Fulbright, who was like a he was a segregationist, but and this may have been the real reason why uh, the RFK. Uh, this may have been part of the reason RFK didn't want to have a segregationist as Secretary of State. Also, so there was that issue as well. But according to Schlesinger, it was his Israel policy. Now, as a side note here, in 1963, a congressman writes a letter to Robert Kennedy asking for an update on the status of the American Zionist Council and the Foreign. Uh, Agent Registration Act, right? Um, and he re referred to a, a Wall Street Journal article indicating that this would depend upon, quote, the risk of offending Jewish opinion in the United States. Now, RFK, uh, his Justice Department, responds to this congressman. This congressman was Donald Rumsfeld, by the way, uh, stating that the ultimate determination will be based on the law as applied to the facts in this particular case and not on any consideration of its effect on the public opinion of the Jewish community in the United States. So Rumsfeld is writing maybe to gauge what they're really saying, maybe to actually influence them in a certain way, saying like, hey, look at this article. But it's fascinating when you think of later on the neoconservative you know, push towards war in Iraq, and Rumsfeld's a part of that. And this involved a lot of you know, right-wing pro-Israel people as well. And here you have Rumsfeld already working in that, in that vein, uh, in a way, as a young congressman. I think that's, that's fascinating. Um, in early 1962, there was a second set of Foreign Relations Committee hearings in the Senate on the issue of uh, the American Zionist Council, led by Senator Fulbright. And in a memo uh, summarizing the hearings, it was determined that the department should insist on the immediate registration of the American Zionist Council under the Foreign Registration Act. And if such a registration, if such registration is not forthcoming, appropriate action should be taken to enforce such a request. So this was them using, you know, the Justice Department using power to go after the um, American Zionist Council, to go after the Israel lobby in the United States. This is the same year that the Justice Department has gone after the biggest corporation in America, um, the uh, U.S. Steel, which we've, we've talked about in a previous episode. So JFK is using the federal government to carry out policy, even if Congress isn't able to act. And in the case of Israel, they won't stand up to them. But very what very easily but they will the, they're using the power of the federal government uh, and the executive branch to implement the policies that they think that the american public elected them to uh, enact so in october of 1963 they never really resolved this issue in october of 1963 the american zionist council is told to file materials to the doj uh, the department of justice has a memo stating this is the most blatant stall we have ever encountered uh, they ultimately submit material in 1965, and the acting attorney general, uh, or, or, or I think just was maybe the attorney general at that point, uh, Katzenbach, I believe that was his position, but he was in charge of it. He comes up later in the assassination. We'll talk about him. Um, but he he closes the case. Now, what happens is the American Zionist Council essentially disbands, and APAC is never is is incorporated by the same guy, uh, and um, they are never forced to register. The same the same people behind the American Zionist Council create APAC and then it officially gets incorporated uh, later uh, around the same time that they were um, going after the American Zionist Council. Like the APAC gets set up already to act in the, in the wings here. And eventually the American Zionist Council just disbands rather than deal with any registering as a foreign agent. And APAC becomes the major thing. Now in 1973, uh, Fulbright tells um, CBS this quote here, Israel controls the U.S. Senate. The great majority of the Senate of the U.S., somewhere around 80%, are completely in support of Israel. Anything Israel wants, Israel gets. And so this is a senator saying this, uh, and it, I think that it holds true to the present day that you don't, 
if Israel has a huge influence in Congress, uh, this was sort of not talked about in polite circles for a long time. I think the Iraq war and the book by Stephen Walt and John Mearsheimer changed, changed this, changes this. And now there's more discussion of Israel and it's kind of pernicious influence on the U S uh, but Fulbright was ahead of his time. And, uh, there weren't many people saying things like this, but he had been around for a long time and had the cachet to do it. Uh, so this is, I think noteworthy. Fulbright is a very strange character in U.S. politics because it represents how much the Democratic Party has changed. Now, you mentioned that obviously we shouldn't just be praising Fulbright. He was a Southern Democrat and he was against racial integration. And there's so many awful things about him. So I'm not saying this to praise him, but it represented that there were different factions in the Democratic Party. And he was always against the Vietnam War. There, there are so many contradictions in characters like him. Despite his his bad views, he was against the Vietnam War. And ironically, you know, people probably know Fulbright because he was one of the creators of the Fulbright Scholarship, which is used to fund uh, students and even professors around the world to study. And of course, Fulbright today has also it clearly has associations with uh, U.S. intelligence agencies. And it's clear that U.S. spy agencies use Fulbright as cover to target countries where the U.S. wants, you know, sensitive information and wants to sit, lay, you know, uh, plant the seeds for color revolutions and all that stuff. But anyway, the point is that um, it showed that there was within the Democratic Party a kind of debate about issues like Vietnam and Israel. This is a this is a senator who was against the Vietnam War for the most part and who was critical of Israel. And whereas today, I mean, almost all Democrats support apartheid Israel. That is kind of changing slowly. And they all support the war in Ukraine. And anyway, um, another key part of this around the same time is Israel's nuclear weapons uh, uh, d program. So it's usually estimated that Israel has nuclear weapons by 1966, although we don't officially know because Israel refuses to admit publicly still today in 2023 that it has nuclear weapons. The exact number is not known, but at least 80 and probably hundreds of nuclear weapons. And it's it's also notable that when in the 1970s, when the apartheid regime in South Africa wanted to get its hands on nuclear weapons, Israel was discussing giving nuclear weapons to apartheid South Africa, which, you know, is a, a horrible historical echo for today, considering you know, how Israel has so many similarities with apartheid South Africa. But in this at this time, the JFK administration is concerned about the possibility of Israel getting nuclear weapons. It's not, again, it's not like today where every time at the United Nations, every year there's a vote to call for a, a, a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. And every single year, every country in the region except Israel votes to call for the region to be a nuclear free zone, by the way, including Iran every single year. And pretty much every country on earth always votes for the UN resolution to call for a nuclear free zone, except for the US and Israel. But again, in the 60s, the situation was a bit different. So what was the JFK's administration policy toward Israel's nuclear program that they knew was ha was being developed? Yes, this was a preoccupation of uh, John Kennedy. He, um, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I think even before he he had you know serious misgivings, the gravest misgivings about the U.S. nuclear uh, nuclear posture and about the idea of nuclear proliferation in general. Um, RFK spoke about this. Um, he said all our energies and all our efforts should be toward getting control over. Uh, the distribution of the knowledge of making atomic weapons, uh, the construction and testing of atomic weapons. His greatest disappointment in 62 and 63 was the fact we hadn't done that. Okay. Now on the Israel question in particular, he was um, very worried about Demona. They had done a cursory inspection. This is the reactor that eventually uh, they're able to make nuclear weapons out of. U.S. had done minor inspections in 1962. JFK wanted more thorough and frequent inspections. Golda Meir lied to the president and said there wouldn't be any difficulty between us on the, the between the U.S. and Israel on this nuclear reactor issue. In January of 1963, Kennedy's CIA director, John McCone, 
issues an NIE on nuclear weapons capabilities. And he's saying that um, the, this reactor could provide enough plutonium for one or two weapons a year. And that by 67 or 68, Israel could have a very limited nuclear weapons capability. Now, people think that Kennedy, it's possible Kennedy selected McCone to replace Dulles because he had to fire Dulles after the Bay of Pigs because of McCone's outspokenness on Israel's nuclear program. Uh, he'd been chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission and made was the person who made Demona known to the public in December of 1960. So Kennedy, uh, you know, this issue, nuclear issue was really huge. Um, the chairman of the Board of National Estimates for the U.S. outlined consequences of a potential U.S. Uh, or is, sorry, Israeli nuclear weapons program. And he said their, their policy towards the, its neighbors, Israel's policy towards its neighbors, would become more rather than less tough. It would seek to exploit psychological advantages of its nuclear capability to intimidate Arabs. And Arab reaction would be profound dismay and frustration. Uh, and among the principal targets of Arab resentment would be the U.S. So it was prophetic about what would happen in the Middle East with Israel becoming stronger and Israel getting the bomb. Now, McCone informs Kennedy of, the, of this memo uh, talking about these issues, after which Kennedy had McGeorge Bundy issue an INSAM on March 26, 1963, and it details Kennedy's concerns. So this is a national security action memorandum. This is the president ordering the national, a national security policy, really. The president desires as a matter of urgency that we undertake every feasible measure to improve our intelligence on the Israeli nuclear program, as well as other Israeli and UAR, that's Egypt's uh, advanced weapons programs. Uh, of course, the only one they're really worried about is, is Israel, Israel's because of, you know they're the ones with a nuclear program. And to arrive at a firmer evaluation of their import. In this connection, he wishes the next informal inspection of the Israeli reactor complex to be undertaken promptly and to be as thorough as possible. So he's issuing a national security directive saying that, that you know, it, it's very urgent to take every measure to improve what we know about this Israeli nuclear program uh, and to, uh, you know, uh, arrive at a better understanding of what they're actually doing. And uh, we got to have this next inspection be as thorough and, you know, complete and, and, and done as soon as possible. This is very, I think, pretty strong language here um, because, and he, he, you know, elsewhere in the memo, he goes on to say that uh, we need clear assurance on this point from the governments and we need means of impressing upon them how seriously such a development would be regarded in this country. So he's very serious about this. In a letter to Ben-Gurion, uh, so he sends a lot of these letters to David Ben-Gurion and um, he he says, all right, let me start this over. In a letter to Ben-Gurion on this subject, he says, I'm sure you will agree uh, that there's no more urgent business for the whole world than the control of nuclear weapons. We both recognized this when we talked together two years ago, and I emphasized it again when I met with Mrs. Meyer just after Christmas. The dangers in the proliferation of national nuclear weapons systems are so obvious that I am sure I need not repeat them here. Um, we are concerned with the disturbing effects on world stability, which would accompany the development of nuclear weapons capability by Israel. Development of a nuclear weapons capability by Israel would almost certainly lead other countries that have so far refrained from such development to feel that they must follow suit. So he specifically was writing to the leader and saying, Ben Gurion, and saying, "This is, this is a uh, we we're very opposed to this, and uh, if you do, it'll just set off an arms race, and this would be a disaster." Now, May 29th, Ben Gurion finally responds to JFK regarding inspections, and he suggests an inspection either at the end of the year or early 1964. In June, uh, JFK, just days after he gives his peace speech, where he talks about ending the Cold War, we'll talk about that in the next episode. Um, and, and part of the peace speech was him calling for a nuclear test ban treaty as the first step towards potential disarmament. So Kennedy is actually talking about everybody disarming. Meanwhile, Israel is saying, like, we want to to do the opposite of disarm. We want to arm ourselves with nuclear weapons. Um, so he writes this letter in, days after he gives this speech to Ben-Gurion requesting more detailed and frequent inspections immediately uh, during early summer of 63, not at the end of the year. So it's already early summer of 63. And he's saying, essentially, we need to start these now. And <clears throat> he states here very equivocally, I think, uh, unequivocal he is, I mean, uh, the government's commitment to and support of Israel could be seriously jeopardized if it should be thought 
that we are unable to obtain reliable information on a subject as vital to peace as the question of the character of Israel's effort in the nuclear field. So this is, um, you know, kind of a bombshell. He's saying that this government's commitment to and support of Israel could be seriously jeopardized if you were not cooperating on this issue. Now, this letter arrives in Israel on June 16th, and what does Ben-Gurion do? He resigns. He never accepts receipt of this letter. Um, people, many, Some people believe that uh, Ben-Gurion resigned, that this was the real reason Ben-Gurion resigned, but that's it's disputed, but to me, that makes the most sense. Um, by, but by resigning, as, uh, as he did, Israel was able to get a six-month delay on JFK's demands for immediate inspections of Demona. The problem was that JFK did not live to see six months. If he had lived, would Israel have nuclear capability today? Would JFK have carried out the ultimatum in his letters had he not been able to secure inspections prior to the reactor going critical? These are This is the way that it's posed by uh, M Monica Wiesak, and I think these are all good questions to ask. Uh, in July of 1960, uh, Three, he sent similar letters to new this new prime minister um, after Ben Gurion, who on July 17th responds saying he needed more time. So he sends this letter in July after Ben Gurion has resigned. The same letter, he's like thinking this issue is important, but the prime minister's resigned. I guess I can't deal with this right now. When the new guy comes in, um, he sends a letter, and the prime minister waits a few days and responds and says he needs more time. So on August 19th, 63, this, this new prime minister replies to Kennedy and agreed to a Demona visit toward the end of 63. Um, he assured him that it would be before the, the reactor was critical and said there could be a follow-up visit in 64. We'll figure this out. Kennedy was satisfied, uh, I guess, at the time and was relieved that there was some, finally some progress. Um, but, you know, at the time of Kennedy's assassination, um, McGeorge Bundy was negotiating with Israel the terms of inspections at Demona, and a sticking point was that Eshkol, the prime minister, did not want Nasser to know about the visits. Whereas for JFK, this was one of the actual prerequisites of the of the inspections. That JFK actually wanted Nasser to know that this was uh, the, that these were being carried out, so that it would put his mind at ease to some degree. Um, I think that's also really. Notable. Now, there are cursory inspections that do occur under LBJ, but they're very limited. Uh, the first inspection didn't occur until 64, but the, re the reactor had already gone critical. Jeff Morley, uh, who's written books on Kennedy assassination related areas like uh, Wynn Scott, uh, who was a CIA chief in Mexico, and he wrote a book on James Angleton. In his book on Angleton, Jeff Morley writes about Jeff Morley writes about NUMEC, which is the Nuclear Materials and Equipment Corporation in Pennsylvania, uh, and how they were funneling key materials to Israel, apparently. And this was known by James Angleton. So after Ben Gurion, who's the CIA counterintelligence chief and a, and a Kennedy enemy, a guy that is very suspicious. Um, after Ben Gurion resigns, um, according to Ephraim Halavi, who served as Mossad's liaison officer to the CIA in Tel Aviv in the early 60s, CIA uh, officer James Angleton went to visit Ben Gurion after his resignation, right? Uh, and he's, he wrote, he, this is what he said, uh, that Angleton used to meet with Ben Gurion, who he knew for many years. Uh, ben Gurion ultimately left office and Angleton went down to Ben Gurion's home to meet him. I didn't attend those meetings. These were just uh, the two of them. They had business to transact. Um, so Angleton is the guy who in 1959, also has tight control over Lee Harvey Oswald's file. Everything gets funneled to him. If Oswald ever comes up, it comes to Angleton's office uh, for very suspicious reasons. Um, and he was also the key CIA liaison to the Warren Commission. In reviewing all of this material on JFK and uh, the, the nuclear issue, the Palestine issue, and so on, Monica Wiesak poses some questions at the end of her, her chapter on Israel. And uh, I, I think this is worth reading here. Had JFK lived, would he have found out about the NUMEC plant at some point? And if so, what would he have done about it? What would the Middle East look like today? Would the refugee issue have been resolved? Would the 1967 war and the resultant occupation of the Palestinian territories to this day have happened? Would Israel expansion have been curbed? curbed? 
Would the Israeli lobbying activities in the U.S. have been curtailed? Would Israel have nuclear capability? Well, I think this is important. Yeah, I mean, once again, it, it does reflect that despite, you know, we have criticisms of JFK, certainly, and we certainly have criticisms of the Democratic Party, but it does show that the Democratic Party of today, or really the Democratic Party of the past 30, 40 years, was not always the Democratic Party that has existed. Clearly, I mean, you can go back before FDR and before the kind of realignment and the Democratic Party was an awful party, clearly. Um, defending segregation and and uh, was not in any way associated with the left. But there was this period with the New Deal Democrats that emerged under FDR, and there were still some vestiges of them in the JFK administration, of the this kind of social democratic wing of the Democrats. You can call them the New Deal Democrats. And they were willing to challenge these hardline hawks and imperialists in parts of the U.S. national security state, like, like for instance, Dulles. Uh, and the fact that JFK was assassinated, I think clearly re represents that the end of that era, the, the uh, physical elimination of one of the last remaining New Deal Democrats. And Israel is an example of that. Also, we're gonna talk more about Vietnam, but I can't imagine today. Well, I guess actually I should be a little more fair that in like the past five, maybe 10 years, there has been a little space that has emerged within the Democratic Party that does allow for some criticism of Israel, mostly because the Israeli regime has become so overtly far right and fascistic. And especially because Benjamin Netanyahu was so closely allied with Donald Trump which did open some political space for Democrats to criticize Israel. But I remember going back, for instance, to the war on terror, the peak in the Bush era, not a single Democrat would ever articulate one criticism of Israel. And here we had JFK, I mean, trying to prevent Israel from getting nuclear weapons. So it really is uh, something so different compared to the Democratic Party of today. And and I'm not one of those people, I would certainly never claim that JFK was assassinated for going against Israel. It's obviously much more complicated. And there are many factors, including JFK's attempt to end the Cold War, JFK's attempt to withdraw from Vietnam, JFK's attempt to try to broker peace and support elements in the non-aligned movement, uh, JFK's back backdoor discussions with Fidel Castro in Cuba. I mean, there are a lot of things that were happening but this is certainly one of the factors in, in why JFK was seen as such a threat to the U.S. political establishment and the ruling class in Washington. And since then, I mean, there hasn't really been any debate about Israel. I guess you could say in the past few years since Donald Trump is maybe the first time since JFK was assassinated. There is a little political space opening up. Yeah, it's hard to say exactly what would have happened with any historical counterfactual, right? Uh, because the outcome of what happened to Kennedy was determined was kind of overdetermined. And as you say, I, I don't. I also don't think it was. Oh yeah, it was Israel, right? I don't think that. I, I, I've never thought that. But this, I think, actually probably was a factor. But it was really overdetermined. Um, JFK did have very different Middle East policies than, than especially from Johnson, what came right after. Uh, JFK supported Nasser, may have been able to support him more in a second term if he was able to wind down the Cold War. This Cold War issue was this winding the Cold War down if impacted everything else that Kennedy tried to do domestically and internationally. And so this, I think, is really notable that he does try to end the Cold War. It's the Cold War that gives hardliners so much power in the U.S., so even though Nasser was a socialist and an Arab nationalist, and he, he was very anti-communist, even though he was he was a socialist, wanted to nationalize a lot of things, but he was anti-communist. The well, Soviet boogeyman could be used anyway. If I can just jump in for a second, this is a a criticism that we sometimes hear of Nasser from the left, but I think it's a little more complicated. I mean, the thing about Nasser is that uh, there were communists who worked in Nasser's government, but it's true that Nasser did take a, a hard line against the Communist Party of Egypt specifically because he saw it as a threat to, to the stability of the government. 
And because the, the Communist Party of Egypt, they called basically for overthrowing the government in a revolution, including against Nasser. So, I mean, it's an example of where this kind of ultra left position can actually end up hurting the, the actually existing socialist left, right? But I just wanted to mention that Samir Amin, for instance, one of the most famous Marxist, uh, Egyptian Marxists in the world, legendary, you know, communist, a, a political economist, Samir Amin, he was involved in the in the Nasser government. But again, like you are right that Nasser did take a line against the Egyptian Communist Party because they took a hard line against him. And it reminds me that there are these moments in history where the communist position, uh, communist parties in these countries take what I think are very wrong positions. An example today, for instance, is AMLO in Mexico. You know, he's, he's a left wing nationalist, but he's not expropriating the Mexican bourgeoisie. The Communist Party of Mexico, uh, when he when AMLO came to power, they said that he's their number one enemy, which is an insane position. And uh, similarly, um, you could say, you know, Mossadegh had a he, with the Tuda party in Iran, the Communist Party. He did sometimes repress the political, the communist movement, but that's because they were trying to remove him from power. So I just wanted to mention that because there are sometimes ultra left critiques of Nasser or people like Mossadegh in Iran and whatever. But the point is that, you know, just because a leader doesn't have the most radical revolutionary positions doesn't mean that they're not a progressive force. And the fact that unfortunately, like in Iraq, the communist party of Iraq supported the U S invasion because they were against Saddam. Anyway. Yeah. This is like, I know this is not the main point we're talking about today with JFK, but I just wanted to throw that in there because, you know, uh, it is a, an ultra left critique we sometimes hear of Nasser. It's, I think it's important and it is actually very relevant because Nasser was a nationalist. And if the communists are, uh, PR as a, as a group, and especially the more, you know, hardline elements of the, of communists are saying that, you know, there is to be no support of nationalists because this is, you know, the incorrect position. This is, I think, kind of the unreal, the unrealistic side of, of the left. And it's not been something that's helped the left to have these positions because the, the, it's not that you want to be an, as a, a nationalist, a goose stepping Nazi type of nationalist, but the nation state is an extant organization that could potentially allow for uh, uh, countries, people in, in these countries that have been colonized and dominated to organize themselves in, into a force that could stand up to imperialism. And just general class consciousness has not really proven to be uh, something that is workable in terms of, of, of doing that. I mean, if the where have the communists been able to, to pull this off very effectively with like purely communist no nationalist sort of project and it's not you know it takes enormous the, the big revolutions that you've had that were actual revolutions against a regime in place not just the, the anti-colonial ones like in uh, cuba and nicaragua were in places like russia and china when they were experienced human misery and hu and world wars that killed you know millions and millions of people this is what it would take for that kind of a revolution to actually succeed and that's where it did succeed which weren't in places like what Marx said, which were was communism arising out of an advanced, you know, class conscious industrial economy. But these were places that were just uh, a, a human, uh, miserable, really miserable, devastated countries where the state could no longer function. And so a communist revolution was able to take take over. So it's, you know, this issue of like what communists should support or should you support any nationalist project? It's hard, it, maybe on a case by case basis, but I think it's really noteworthy that like Rockefeller and the Trilateral Commission, these groups were stating explicitly in the 70s when they're trying to create this, uh, what becomes the neoliberal world order, they were saying our enemy is nationalism. So if capital is saying our enemy is nationalism, the why are communists saying our enemy is nationalism? Do they really think that the, the, the communists and David Rockefeller have the same enemies? I don't yeah. think that's reasonable. Yeah, I wanted to mention that just because politics has changed so much since the 1960s that in the, in this moment which is you know the peak of the anti-colonial national liberation struggles there was a debate in a lot of in the a lot of parts of the left around the world where there were the hardline more orthodox communist parties some of them it, there were splits right and especially with the sino-soviet split it became even more complicated right then you have like the whole so-called revision so-called revisionist camp and the so-called anti-revisionist camp anyway whatever um but the point is that 
there were some communists who took the position that nationalism in the colonial countries is not a is not what something we should support. It's not seen as a progressive force against colonialism and imperialism and capitalism. Whereas there were others who were very supportive of left-wing nationalist struggles. Of course, there's a huge difference between right-wing nationalism, which is, you know, Trumpian nationalism or French nationalism of Le Pen or fascism, which is far-right nationalism and left-wing nationalism. Most existing socialist governments in history have been left-wing nationalist governments in the global south, right? You know, Cuba is run by a communist party, but it has elements of that. Nicaragua very much is, you know, a nationalist, left-wing nationalist project. Venezuela, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, you know, Burkina Faso. Like, there are many examples. Uh, Eritrea. But the point is that at that in this moment in the 60s, because the left was so powerful around the world, today, basically, the left... It's coming back, but it was beaten back so much that many left-wing nationalists and communists made common cause and were allies, right? But in the 60s, some of the, sometimes they were fighting against each other. So in the cases of places, um, you know, we talk about Qasem and the war, the uh, coup in Iraq. Qasem was a leftist uh, Iraqi nationalist who was allied with the communists and was overthrown. But... Um, Nas is an example of where like there were communists who supported him, but then there were others who were against him. So it's just it's it, it's a very interesting moment in history where because the the majority of national liberation struggles were led by leftist movements, left wing nationalist movements or communist movements or some kind of socialist movement, because there was such a big variety, there was much more internal sectarianism, right? Whereas when the left is weaker it's much easier to unify because the minor differences over certain issues don't matter as much yes it's um i mean these are these are issues that come up again and again and uh i think that it's we we have enough history to see what has happened to these you know these countries that didn't have any sort of or these these leftist entities that didn't have a more i mean if you say internationalist Okay, that's a, a, you can be a nationalist and an internationalist. That's what I think Nasser was. That's what I, I really think JFK was was like that himself. That he wanted a co internationalism, meaning a cooperative nationalism. Um, if and this makes sense, meaning you understand that countries that you can have win win relationships between nation states because the nation states is still relevant, and so nationalism is still a re is still relevant. But that you could uh, advance common prosperity. Uh, through cooperative nationalism, you know, and this is uh, this is what China is essentially picking up this project because the U.S. abandoned it a long time ago. The U.S. Uh, there were rhetorical r allusions to this throughout much of uh, the, the Cold War up until you know Reagan or or whatever, and even even then, there's still the kind of rhetorical nods to like, oh yeah, let's have countries work together and, and, and progress. But everybody knows that the U.S. has set up a kind of empire where they they benefit from this system and countries cannot really develop very much or make much social progress because any of the policies that would do this, like nationalizing valuable resources to improve social you know, infrastructure, this is destroyed by the U.S. The U.S. won't tolerate this. So really, there hasn't been much progress in recent decades in human uh, societies that you can measure uh, by, you know, human uh, indicators, right? Uh, except in China, where they pursued slightly different policies. That's the main reduction in poverty in the last like 30 years is really, uh, it, it comes overwhelmingly from Chinese policies because in the rest of the world, they're really constrained by U.S. foreign policy and the, the, the Washington consensus. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, you know, a time to think about what, what people like Kennedy and Nasser were actually going for. Uh, and as far as this Middle East question goes, um, he was working for JFK was working for a decent resolution of the Palestinian re refugee crisis. I don't think that if JFK survives, there's any way you get the 1967 war or this, you know, murderous false flag attack on the USS Liberty, which was a part of that 67 war or the horrific 1967 apartheid regime in Israel. Um, they went on, Israel would go on to become an even more malign force in U.S. politics 
uh, along with other lobbies. It's not just the Israel lobby. Obviously, you have the oil lobby, weapons lobby, big pharma, health insurance, tech monopolies, uh, banking, agribusiness. You have other foreign lobbies like the Saudis and the Turkish lobby, for example, that have had a pernicious influence at times. But the Israel lobby is, is, a, is a problem. JFK wanted them to register as a foreign agent. Today, APAC is exempt from this requirement, uh, and they can destroy Congress people's chances uh, of re-election or election in the first place. This, is, this seems to be what happened with Cynthia McKinney, who I know went on to um, voice some not constructive you know, opinions on, on Israel and its influence. But she, she was, you know, uh, they did fund her opponents, as I understand it, uh, generously. And that led to her being, you know, losing in Congress. Um, JFK saw this problem of campaign finance as a, a part of the bigger, th with Israel, as part of a bigger issue facing campaign financing in general. Uh, ours is kind of an indefensible system when you think of the outcomes of our, our campaign finance system. It reproduces anti-democracy or oligarchy uh, as a system of governance year in, year out. Uh, JFK wanted to curtail this Zionist influence and just private uh, in the private influence of individuals through money in general. But this problem has, has only gotten much worse after Kennedy died. I don't believe that, that the U.S. would have turned a blind eye to Demona because JFK was pretty obsessed with that issue. But they did end up turning a blind eye to Demona because JFK was dead. Um, I think that JFK was undone in the end, as we'll get to uh, in a future episode, by the American deep state, which is really a kind of fascism. Um, and part of this system of, of a, a, a secret fascist sovereign in, uh, managing the U.S. empire is some of these client states that we have, because they are even less accountable than our own government in a way, but they're really totally subservient or have been until recently to the U.S., U.S. empire. So Israel is a part of this deep state, and the Saudis are also various corrupt client governments. These have been pillars of America's empire and what has been somewhat of a fascist project uh, to, main, to stop socialism at all costs, any sort of alternative to capitalism, imperial capitalism. They're part of this imperial strategy for the Middle East. I do believe that Kennedy wanted to do something similar in terms of the, the world order that, that Henry Wallace has suggested in his Century of the Common Man speech. And it's similar to what China is trying to accomplish now uh, in, in the region and really in, in the world. Um, Kennedy supporting people like Nasser in Egypt or Mossadegh uh, supporters in Iran, you know, looking into that possibility because he didn't like the Shah. This is something like win-win foreign policy. Uh, and that was that's what Kennedy, I think, was trying to pursue and China now is, is trying to win global public opinion or just create a better world order for itself as well at the same time by promoting this kind of idea as a win-win interactions between nations that it doesn't have to be a, we're just dominating you and you better do what we say or else. Uh, th in the Cold War, they could get the U.S. could get away with all of this, and then afterwards they're so powerful nobody can stand up with, uh, with them for having a win-lose foreign policy more or less. The thing is, it was never about cold, the, the Cold War and the threat of so, the Soviet Union to the United States. It was always about empire. The architects of the Cold War knew this better than anyone. They just couldn't admit it. Um, what Kennedy was trying to do in terms of ending the Cold War and creating a, you know, peaceful coexistence in the Middle East was, was unacceptable to them, and it was going to damage their long-term plans. So they were going to stop JFK by any means that they could and I, I do believe also that they did it in such a way as to send a message to anyone who comes after him because uh, they could have killed him in a subtle way. They could have poisoned him in some way or given him a heart attack. You know, they have that kind of weird technology. I'm, I'm pretty sure they did back then, too. But they didn't. They killed him in high noon with an impossible set of circumstances that, that kind of fall apart. That the public never really believed that much. And yet it just stood there. And I think part of that was maybe a, a, a warning to people. Um, Alan Dulles said that little Kennedy, he thought he was a god. And you have to think about what he meant by that. He didn't mean it favorably. And what, why did he say that? And I think it's because uh, like the real conclusion here, if you're honest about it, is going to be that Kennedy was actually trying to make some big changes and walk away from what people like Alan Dulles uh, had formulated about what should be this American empire. 
And, you know, you can, people can argue as to, if you accept that this is what Kennedy was trying to do, then you can argue about why he was trying to do it. Was it ego that he, did he really think he was a God and wanted to be the hero of the world or something? Or did he, was this also grounded in an understanding of what America's national interest is? Because as we see what's unwinding now with the, the U S empire, I think unraveling, you know, we'll see what things look like in the next, over the next few years, but this has not been in America's national interest to pursue this kind of empire on this scale to try to dominate the world under American auspices. You just generate, you distort and deform your own society and you generate the forces that are inevitably going to bring the project down. People should have seen this before. This is the, the, the U S empire will go the way of all empires because that's sort of in the part, in part of the definition. So this wasn't a far-sighted policy and, and it, the problem was it benefited so many people in power as it still does that it, it takes on a, a, a life and a dominance in society that you can't, that we can't even uh, imagine. We, we don't have the intellectual and epistemological uh, foundation to, eat, to the, the majority of the population to really grapple with what this empire is and what the alternatives are. Uh, and this is, I think, by design. They don't want people to be able to think of an alternative. They don't want internationally or in the U.S. population. And so here we are. We're stuck in this situation. But uh, I think there were I think that there were efforts by some people in U.S. politics to uh, go in a more democratic direction. I think that they just underestimated the extent to which this is a fascist project. So it, among Kennedy's weaknesses was the fact that he and his, and his brother did not really, they believed in, in some of the myths about American democracy and so on. And they thought you could change things this way. And uh, we find out that they couldn't and Egypt finds out that they couldn't as well. well and, I the think that's a good... and the Palestinians. Yeah, still today. Well, that's a good note to end on. This is the Empire and Deep State series that is based on Aaron's book, American Exception. And Aaron is the co-host of the American Exception podcast, along with Seamus McGinnis. He had to leave early for other work. But uh, if you all want to get early access to the episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash American Exception. And eventually the video will be posted later here at Geopolitical Economy Report. And I want to thank everyone for watching or listening. We are going to be continuing going forward, leading up to the JFK assassination and then continuing the history of the U.S. empire. So another great episode, Aaron. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks to Seamus McGinnis for producing the audio and video versions of this episode. Also, thanks to Mock Orange for providing the music. At the risk of being repetitious, I just want to say that while I do not think we can attribute Dallas to Israel or quote-unquote the Jews, it's worth thinking about how Zionism is both a fascist project and one that became a core constituency of U.S. parafascism, the supranational U.S.-led coalition of global right-wing statesmen and elites that collaborated to institutionalize a system of cloaked fascist governance with a liberal democratic mythos that was essentially a massive cover story. In the next installment, we are going to look at how JFK spent the last year of his life fighting for peace. Until then, mind the light. What